Yeah, I just started recording. All right, I'm going to hit start webinar now. You ready? Here we go. Yep. Okay, here we go. So I'll just tell folks we're going to, we're going to hang on until more people join. Great. Hi, everybody. If you're just joining us, we are going to be just a minute or two. We're going to let more folks join and then we will get started. All right, we're going to give folks about another minute and then we will get started. All right, if you're just joining us, just another few seconds and we will get started. Okay, let's, let's get started. So welcome, welcome to the webinar today. I am Keith Wolf, I'm Managing Director of Murray Resources. We are a Houston-based recruiting and staffing organization. And I'm also the CEO of Resume Spice. We are a career coaching and resume writing company. So to all of you who have attended one of our webinars before, thank you, welcome back. We're so glad you came back. And if this is your first one attending, well, welcome. I think you'll really enjoy it. And most importantly, I think you'll really get some great tips that you can start impl implementing in your work and life immediately. So before we get started, this webinar is gonna be 60 minutes. Jen, our speaker has let me know that she may run a few minutes over. And anytime a great speaker says that might happen, I take them up on it because I never want to cut them short. I want to get all the information that we can, but I also understand that folks may have to hop off right after 60 minutes. And if that's the case, that's completely fine. This webinar is being recorded and we will submit the recording to everybody who is on. But also know if you're like me, uh, how often do you go back and watch the recording? You know, so <laughs> even despite my best intentions, so do try to hang on if you can. And also Jen will be taking questions throughout and, and at the end. You can submit questions during the webinar and we will take some breaks to, to do that. Um, but again, I will also take some questions from the audience that we will ask Jen at the end. Everybody is muted. We've got, we uh, have over 400 people who've registered for this event. So to let Jen be heard, we have everybody on mute. So if you've got dogs in the background or someone mowing the lawn, we can't hear it, we can't see you. So no problem there. And like I said, um, we'll be sharing the video and we'll also be sharing the slides with everybody who attended. So today's talk is Think Like a Juggler, Proven Strategies for Balancing Work and Life. And I think it is the perfect topic right now. If you're like so many folks, you're really trying to do it all, trying to balance work and life. And maybe you're back at the office, maybe you're still at home working remotely, you're juggling kids, maybe older parents. And uh, by the way, there's still a pandemic going on. So there's just a lot, um, even when there's not a pandemic, there's a lot to juggle in our lives. So with that, let me introduce our speaker, Jen Slaw. Uh, so happy to have her here today. She works with companies 
who are struggling to keep up with constant change and who are looking to create a more positive work environment to improve team engagement and navigate change with a growth mindset. She's been seen on ABC, NBC, Fox, and in various news and morning TV shows, The Late Show with David Letterman, Off-Broadway, uh, TEDx stages and corporate stages and conference rooms across the country. She's a structural engineer by training. She's an artist and she's a world record holding huggler, which she just described to me what that was, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, but her favorite role is being a mom to three-year-old John Luca. She's challenged every day to be the best mother juggler she can be. And she looks forward to sharing those experiences with all of you. So with that, thank you, Jen. Thank you for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Keith. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for being here today. As Keith said, you know, we are living in this crazy time, probably the most challenging time ever for achieving work-life balance. As Keith said, whether you're working remotely, you've got kids at home, there's health and, and wellness challenges, job insecurities, and there's no miracle answer. And I'm sorry to tell you that balance doesn't really exist, at least in the way we like to think about it. There's not a work you and a life you, these separate entities, it's all messy and intertwined and combined. And you might have to be juggling with a baby strap to your chest, right? But don't leave, no false advertising here. Stick with us because if we can shift our mindsets and start to look at it more as work-life integration, work-life juggling, where the goal is really more fulfillment, presence and focus and purpose rather than balance, then we can start to make progress towards feeling more centered in our lives. So this is not going to be your typical webinar. I have asked you, I know you've gotten some messages about having three objects ready to toss around. I know that not all of you have professional juggling balls at your home, that's fine. You probably have rolled up socks, which are just perfect or oranges or lemons or apples. I know Keith's got some, some candy there. So make sure you have three things. The reason for this is twofold. I want to shift your energy, your mindset, your physicality. And two, it really helps to illustrate some of the principles that we're going to be talking about from juggling that can apply to our lives. And now I can't see you, so you may just sit there and not participate, but you're going to get more out of it if you join in the interactive exercises as we go along and if you try this. So let's just get a feel for the room. Um, go ahead into the chat and put in one word about how you're feeling right now. How are you feeling this afternoon? Uh, what's going on in your life? Let's just, uh, I wanna see who's here in the room. Let's just uh, get some feedback about how people are feeling. Florence is feeling happy, wonderful. Robert is feeling a little anxious, I hear you. A lot of us are there. Tired, overwhelmed, Dominique, joyful, wonderful tired, stressed, tired, burdened, yes. Okay, this is, these are very challenging times. And a lot of us, when we're dealing with constant change, a lot of us start to feel fear and overwhelm. Fear, we're afraid to take risks. We can get stuck and unable to break those cycles that may or may not be working for us at a time where we need to take those risks, right? We need to be finding creative solutions to our challenges. And overwhelm, on the other hand, you know, our roles and responsibilities have shifted and we're juggling more than ever and we're having multitasking and productivity challenges. So my goal with you today is to get you started in moving and shifting from that overwhelm and fear to a place of creative exploration. And the way I see it, there's three components to making this happen. We have to embrace continuous learning and improvement, always tweaking and shifting. You know, I said balance doesn't really exist in the way that we think about it. A lot of us wanna think about balance as static. Balance is not static. If you imagine a tightrope walker at the circus, you know, constantly moving and shifting and making those little adjustments to maintain the balance. So we constantly have to be open to that continuous learning and improvement. Number two, we really have to look at how can we better integrate our work and life and all the different things that we're juggling. And number three, how can we create and nurture a collaborative environment at work and at home? Same principles apply, same leadership and team building principles can apply to our work colleagues and to our family members. So I'd like you to think about a time before you knew how to put food on a spoon and get that spoon into your mouth. Does anybody remember that time? Go ahead and, and type into the chat Y for yes or N for no. Do you remember a time before you could get food on the spoon and get the spoon into your mouth? 
Okay, I see Chantel, Bonnie, April, Tanya, Florence, all saying no, 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 no. None of us can remember that time. But there was a time before we could do that and it was a long, messy process of learning how to do that. And now it's second nature and we don't even remember a time before we could do that. It's kind of like juggling for me. It's hard to imagine a time before I could keep those three balls in the air. What I want you to do right now is really think about a challenge, an obstacle, a problem in your life right now. And if you feel comfortable, you can share it in the chat, one of your, one of your biggest challenges right now. If not, just kind of reflect on that and then let this sentence sink in. The expert in anything was once a beginner. The expert in anything was once a beginner. It can be so hard to have patience with ourselves. This is a totally new world for all of us and we're all navigating and shifting and we have to be patient with ourselves as we find the right mix and it takes time. So let's just keep in that embrace as we go. So just a little backstory on me because I always get a lot of questions. Uh, you can see that from a very young age, I was destined to become a juggler. <laughs> that is actually a photo of an ultrasound of uh, my son. It may have been photoshopped just a little bit. Um, and then next to that is a photo of me as a toddler with the two golf balls that I insisted on carrying around at all times. But it wasn't until the sixth grade that I learned how to juggle. This is a photo of my middle school juggling club where I was the only girl. And as you can imagine, this was the really cool club to be in in middle school. <laughs> but we learned how to juggle. Our teacher taught us how to juggle as a lesson in focus and concentration. He said, everyone in this class can learn how to keep three balls in the air. And everyone did. It took some of us a little bit longer. Some of us enjoyed it more. I loved it. And it was something that, you know, at a time that can often be awkward for young girls, it was something that gave me confidence. I love being able to do things that other people couldn't. And I excelled academically, juggling all along on the side. I went on to become valedictorian of my high school class and go on to Swarthmore College to major in art and engineering, as Keith said. Fast forward, I moved to New York City after college and started working as a structural engineer. Ultimately felt that that wasn't where I was meant to be. I was missing a creative connection to other people, the chance to see my projects realized and, and just really exercising my creativity. So I had been juggling all along on the side and performing on the side with some of these former students and that, that teacher. And I did what any rational person would do. I quit my engineering job and became a professional juggler. And this is what a lot of people think of when they think of professional juggler, right? Clown, jester, kind of silly. And I certainly have done my share of those gigs over the years. Uh, but as Keith mentioned, I've had some amazing opportunities as a performer to appear on Letterman, to co-create and star in an off-Broadway show, to uh, get some attention here from the Today Show with huggling, which is a combination of hugging and juggling that became a social experiment around New York uh, to find unique ways of connecting and sharing joy. And along the way, I got involved with a charity called Juggling Life that utilizes juggling as a way to engage and inspire young people. And I was invited to speak at a TEDx conference about the charity's work and about how we were using juggling as a tool to help redefine what's possible in these young kids' lives. And that was really the catalyst to get me thinking that a lot of these principles of juggling, things that I've benefited from you know, growing up in the formative years can really be helpful to help us shift our mindset and be more productive, more fulfilled, more focused in our work and lives. And that led me to create programs like the one I'm sharing with you today. So what I want you to do with me this morning, with this afternoon is embrace the juggler's mindset. This is a mindset of juggling our responsibilities, of focus, not multitasking. You'll notice that when I juggle three balls, I'm focused. I'm focused on what I'm doing. I'm focused on that one ball that's in the air each split second, one, 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 one. And we'll get to that um, in a few more minutes, but it's not multitasking. Juggling is about focus and it's about staying nimble in the face of change and being able to make those little adjustments to catch if a ball move, you know, goes slightly over here or slightly over there. So there's three components to what I call the juggler's mindset. First, we have to have a clear goal. We have to understand what it is we're trying to accomplish. You've heard this before, have set SMART goals, something specific, something measurable, achievable, results focused, and time bound. In this case, today, we are trying to learn how to juggle. That's a very clear, specific goal. Let's learn how to juggle three balls together. Now, the second piece of this is to really embrace a growth mindset. Professor Carol Dweck from Stanford University coined the terms fixed mindset and growth mindset. Many of you are probably familiar with those terms. 
essentially a fixed mindset is one in which we believe the, the hand of cards that we're dealt is that's what we have to live with. So I may not be good at this. I'm just not good at numbers. I'm just not very organized and we don't have a lot of room for growth. A growth mindset, on the other hand, as you can imagine, allows us to really embrace the fact that qualities and skills can be cultivated through effort. And you want to start to say things to yourself like failure is an opportunity for me to grow. I can learn to do anything I want. Feedback is constructive. Challenges help me to grow. And this is a process. And if we all are honest with ourselves, we probably have a little bit of that fixed mindset in certain areas of our lives and the growth mindset in others. But just reflect for yourself about how you can start to embrace that growth mindset in more areas of your life. So we've got the clear goal. We have a growth, uh, we're embracing a growth mindset. And then we need to put into place a system of deliberate practice. So in juggling, it's not just about doing the same thing over and over again. We have to look at really being deliberate about the way we practice. And that means there are five components in place. We are open to feedback. Again, we have the clear goal. We are able to focus on one thing at a time and improving one aspect at a time. We are open or willing to have a mentor or an advisor, and we're willing to get outside of our comfort zones. Sometimes we don't want to, but that's really where the learning and the transformation will happen, getting outside of our comfort zone. So with that, I would like you all to pick up your, your one object. Okay, I've got the juggling ball here, and I know I can't see you, so I wish I could see you all, but uh, there's a lot of you on the, on the call today, so I'm trusting that many of you are going to do this along with me. Place the ball in your hand and just start to throw it back and forth, or the object, the rolled up socks, the apples, the oranges, and just start to throw it back and forth. What you want to do is throw it a little bit above your head with a little bit of a scooping motion as it crosses over to the other side. Now you'll notice you don't need to look down at your hands. You need to be focused up at the top of the arc of the object. All you need to do is focus there and your brain does the work to tell your hands where to go to catch it. So let's just do that a few more times. And what I'd like you to consider and notice is are you throwing the same to the same height from each hand? We want to try to get more consistent so that you're throwing the same height from right and left, back and forth. This is just a great exercise to shift your energy, as I said in the beginning, get you up on your feet and just moving to kind of free up your mind. It can be very meditative. So we're throwing that back and forth, back and forth. Feel your shoulders relax as you do this, your feet planted on the floor. Breathe. And now what I'd like you to do is as the object hits the peak, just right up there at the top, I'd like you to try clapping your hands and catching the ball. Throw, clap, catch, throw, clap, catch, throw, clap, catch, throw, clap, catch. All right, give yourselves a hand and you can uh, take a break from that. <laughs> we'll come back to this. Uh, we'll come back to this and start to add more objects in just a few minutes. So there's a lot to look forward to. Now, we, with our goal being to learn how to juggle three balls, did we start with three balls? No, we start with a single ball and we build up one step at a time. So what I'd, I'd like to invite you to do today is embrace what I call the ball framework to give you a new vocabulary, a new mantra as you try to master the work-life juggle. So we start with a single ball, B-A-L-L, -L, break it down, ask for help, learn from the drops and let it go. Break it down, ask for help, learn from the drops and let it go. When you can really embrace these four simple, yes, we've heard them before or variations of them, but when you can really embrace these principles and put them into action in your lives, you will start to feel more centered, more focused, more present and be able to be more productive. So let's go through uh, and talk about each of them one at a time. So break it down. This is pretty self-explanatory. We have to learn how to break things down into steps. And it sounds easy, but it can be challenging. When we have an, uh, an overwhelming goal or a challenge, it can be challenging to break it down into, into action steps, but that's what's needed if we're going to take those steps to achieve that goal. So I like the GOSPA model, goals, objectives, strategies, projects, and actions. So here's an example. You know, this goal, we have this goal of we have to be productive working remotely, okay? That's kind of an overwhelming goal. How am I going to be productive working at home? I have constant interruptions. I have the kids here. I have, you know, maybe uh, parents. I have my spouse who's also trying to work from home. 
So how are we going to do this? Let's break it down. So we have an objective. Maybe our objective or our shorter, shorter term, more specific goal is that I have to work eight hours a day. I have to get eight hours of work in. Okay, what's my strategy for making that happen? Well, I can set up a separate workspace. I can create time blocks. I can communicate with my family. There are all these different strategies that I can start to put in place to make that happen. Okay, what's a project I can start that helps me to achieve, execute one of those strategies? Well, if I'm going to set up a workspace, I need to set up my desk. I need to set up some kind of signal uh, that I'm working. So what's your first action step? Maybe it's to put a sign on your office door. Mom or dad is working right now. Sounds simple, but taking this simple step, this easy to do step then puts into motion a process that helps us to achieve that more overwhelming goal. Where if we just sat with that overwhelming goal, we wouldn't know what to do and we can get paralyzed. So we've got the action steps. Now these two go hand in hand, action steps and focus. As I said, juggling is about focus, not multitasking. You have to focus on one action at a time. And even though there's a lot going on, even though there's three balls in the air, it's one at a time. And for that split second, my job is to focus on the ball that's in the air. This is not easy to do in real life when other things are happening and you have constant interruptions. Um, and we can talk during the question and answer session if you have specific challenges and about some um, tools and apps that might help you to do this but you have to be able to focus on one thing at a time. And it's a constant practice. I mean, I found myself yesterday playing trains, playing Thomas the Train with my son and thinking, oh, I've got to prepare that. I've got to double check that PowerPoint and make sure everything's the way I want it for my webinar tomorrow. And I had to catch myself and say, okay, stop. Focus on Thomas the Train. And in 15 minutes, you can go and work on that, that presentation. And then we're really able to be more present with what we're doing with the ones that we love. And we're able to be more, more productive when we're doing those things. Um, well, welcome, Angie, so sad she just joined, but welcome, we have a lot more coming, <laughs> so don't worry. Um, so one of the other things we need to do is learn how to focus and prioritize what's important versus what's urgent. And some of you have probably heard this before. We're gonna get a little bit into, more into this in a second, um, but just a quick visual. Here's the sign that I put up on my door. Uh, that first step, that first step towards being productive and accomplishing your work while at home with all these interruptions and just to keep it real, here's what my three and a half year old thought of that sign. <laughs> so we'll get into uh, in, our, in our third step, learn from the drops, what went wrong, what could I have done differently? We'll get into that, but it's reality. We're all dealing with this and it's a constant challenge, a constant process to make it work. So many of you have probably seen this visual metaphor before, the rocks, the pebbles, and the sand fitting into the jars. How can you fit everything in? You know, we have so many things to juggle. How can you fit it all into one day? Can you distinguish, can you differentiate what are your big rocks and what are your little rocks? What are the glass juggling balls that you really can't drop? And what are the rubber balls that will bounce back? Start to think about what's really important and what's kind of just urgent and those things that maybe aren't really advancing the goals that you need to get done. And as you can see from this, this visual metaphor here with the jars, the jars being equal in size, representing our time and our energy. We only have so much. If we put all that little stuff in, all that urgent stuff that maybe is not important, all that sand, if we put that into our jars first and then the pebbles, there will be not enough room for all of our big rocks, all of our important priorities, our glass balls to fit in. However, if we take care of those big rocks first, if we get them in the jar, then the pebbles and the sand can fill in the space around and we can fit everything in that needs to get done. So just to, to look at an, another framework to look at this idea of starting to gauge um, what's urgent versus what's important in your life. And this can be challenging. Um, the Stephen Covey Eisenhower productivity matrix is a great way to start to look at this. Um, President Eisenhower had said, what is important is seldom urgent and what is urgent is seldom important. So let's talk about this um, a little bit. So we've got four quadrants here. You can see at the top, I have urgent and not urgent and along the, the left-hand side, important and not important. So in that first quadrant, urgent and important, this is like juggling fire, juggling the glass balls, deadlines, uh, emergencies, you have to take care of it right away. It's, you've got to do, you've got to manage. Maybe you've procrastinated and now you have to get something done because there's a deadline. Okay, urgent and important. Not urgent, but important. What, what does this look like? This looks like Getting a team working together to do a, what I call a group juggle where everyone is engaged and interacting with each other. This is about building relationships. This is about your exercise um, plan, your wellness, things that 
are extremely important in the long term and are going to benefit you way more in the long term, but are maybe not as urgent, so they get put to the side. This quadrant number two is where we want to be focusing. We want to shift our focus from that quadrant number one where we're dealing with the emergencies and putting out the fires to quadrant number two where we can focus on that long-term goal achievement and building those relationships and building a system or a process that will work for us. Now, the not important things, the not important urgent things are kind of like someone throwing their juggling balls at you and you better catch it because it's coming at your head. So it is kind of urgent, but it's not necessarily important for, for you, for advancing what you what your priorities are. So it may be calls or emails or things like that, that you know are someone else's priorities. And those are the kinds of things that we want to look at. Can I delegate this? Can I start to avoid some of this by delegating it? Quadrant number four, the not urgent, the not important, this is where we don't want to be at all, if possible. We want to eliminate this stuff. This is the endless scrolling on social media that all of us are guilty at at some point or another. The mindless TV watching, um, mails, calls, busy work. We want to eliminate this stuff. You know, learning how to juggle and having to post it on social media. <laughs> not important, not urgent, and it's not advancing your priorities, your goals. So again, look at what look in your life at in your life. What is important? What is just that urgent stuff that you can start to eliminate? You can start to delegate. You can put to the side and really focus on that quadrant number two, the things that are not necessarily urgent, but are really important to your quality of life. Okay, so we've got break it down. We've got that action steps, the focus, the priorities. And then what we have to do is connect everything, connect or blend all this, these different priorities, the different pieces, and then strengthen the connections between the things that we're juggling. So I'm gonna give you a, a little visual example here. And as I do this, as I do some juggling for you, I'd like you to be thinking about how can you connect the pieces in your own lives in new ways? How can you connect the dots in new ways? How can you look for unexpected combinations and creative patterns? So I'm gonna stop the share for just a second so that you can see me a little larger and uh, get some juggling balls. And now here is the basic juggle that we are going to attempt to learn together today. But there are so many different ways to combine the balls. You see that juggling is not just about the throws and catches. It's also about the space between the throws and catches. And you can see that if I throw one ball, particularly high up into the air, I have to wait longer before releasing the next ball. Otherwise, I'll have too many balls in the air at once, making my life a lot more difficult. So we have to look at that space between. And how can we make it a little more interesting? How can we make it a little more creative and find those creative solutions? Some of us are more linear than others. So as you can see, so many different ways to combine the balls into different patterns, catching it on the backs of our hands, things we never would think to do, throwing more than one at a time. Sometimes batching things can help us to be more productive. Oh, drop, we pick it up and we start again. I'll do one more for you here, get a little complicated. Ta-da, there we go, thunderous applause, I know. <laughs> Let's see some exclamation points in the chat if you like the juggling. <laughs> so as you can see, there are so many different ways to combine the balls. And you know, before I, before I go back to the slides, I'm gonna grab one more because sometimes the more we have to juggle, we can actually be more balanced if we arrange them in the correct pattern. So if I'm juggling two over here, you can see that I'm very off balance across my body. But if I add another two in over here, now I'm nice and even. So even though I'm juggling four and it takes more practice and more skill, I'm ultimately more balanced. This is kind of how I felt majoring in art and engineering, right? It took a lot of time and energy, but it was more balanced. I don't think I would have been able to do just engineering without that creative outlet. So as you can see, lots of different ways to combine the balls. Now with five, I'm gonna show off just a little bit before we go back to the presentation. With five, we can do them one at a time, which is actually probably the most difficult. Oh, there we go. Or two at a time, which is a little bit easier. So you can see where maybe batching things together can be helpful and this can translate into our lives as well. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna go back to the presentation. Thank you for those exclamation points. Always like to know people are, are, are there and enjoying it. Yes, it's a great metaphor and it's more than a metaphor. It's so much more than metaphor. These principles can really apply uh, to our work and to our lives. 
So as we're looking now at practicality, what does this look like? How can we start to integrate those pieces of our work and life? I want to just share this quote with you from Stuart Friedman, who's a professor at Wh the Wharton School, and he's the director of their work-life integration project. He says, you're more likely to be successful when you creatively bring the different parts of your life together. Significant achievement results from compassionate action to use one's talents to make the world somehow better. And just a reminder, a little visual reminder for those of you who are managing staff, when we can give our staff the tools and support they need to integrate work and life and so that they're connected to their purpose, then we attract and retain more good people. And when those good people feel valued and supported, they can do their best work and they'll be able to take risks. They'll be willing to collaborate, innovate and create that positive change that is so needed right now. So let's look at uh, Dr. Stuart Friedman's model, which I love because first of all, it looks like juggling balls, <laughs> but his model talks about four circles that, inter that intersect and overlap and connect in our lives. The kind of four main areas of our lives, work, self, community and home. Now these circles expand and contract at different parts of our lives. So, you know, when I was a brand new mom and have this baby, the, the, the home life, the family life just expands and takes over everything else, right? Now they're kind of with, every, with everything mixed up like it is now with working remotely and being at home and the family, everything might be overlapping even more, but that gives us more of an opportunity to look at those creative connections. So, we go back to, again, establishing those priorities, those big rocks, those glass balls. What are your values, goals, interests, actions in each of these domains? And then how can you start to combine them even more intentionally? So just uh, to give you some ideas, and then we can talk about this more uh, as we go into the Q&A. You know, how are you combining work and self? Well, your work and self start to merge when you feel that you're utilizing your talents, when you're engaged, when you feel appreciated and fulfilled. Your home and self, you know, when you're connecting with your family, when you get to experience relaxation and gratitude and engage in hobbies, um, a, a challenging one, of course, work and home, that can really be aided by storytelling, communication, sharing, sharing what it is you're doing with that child that wants to come into your room and, and engaging them um, in what you're doing. Of course, community and home, you know, can you engage in family and neighborhood projects that start to merge those two? Work and community, when we feel connected to a larger purpose, we're that much more invested in the work that we do and there's that social mission, that vision aspect. So just to give you a, a couple little visuals about how this, what this looks like in my own life, um, exercise, my exercise these days is chasing around after a three and a half year old as he rides his scooter, I jog. And so we're combining that family and that exercise time. You have to get creative folks, right? Three and a half year olds surprisingly love to vacuum. So I'm taking advantage of that fact because I know it won't last forever and utilizing uh, that, that interest in helping me to keep the house in order. This is a, just a fun little time-lapse video of my son Gianluca helping me to organize the shelves that you see behind me. We recently moved, talk about reprioritizing. We decided to make a big move from, from one state to another during a pandemic. I don't necessarily recommend this, but it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful to just reprioritize uh, what's important for our family. But I needed to get these shelves set up and I also needed to be with my son. And we kind of gamified it. You know, we, I showed him what a time-lapse video looks like and he was so excited to make this time-lapse video. Let's see how fast we're moving when we're filling these shelves. And he actually did a really great job helping me fill my shelves and get organized. And that photo in the, the bottom left-hand corner is just a photo of me hosting um, the National Speakers Association New York City chapters events one of the things that I do to combine my community and my work is to volunteer and be a board member with uh, my peers and colleagues at the National Speakers Association. And this is something that feeds that need for community and connection and also helps to benefit uh, my work uh, overall. So just a few uh, examples there to help you visualize what that might look like in your own life. So what I'd like to do now is pick up that second object and walk you through the physicality of starting to combine two balls together, okay? So again, I'm gonna stop the share for just a moment so you can see me a little larger and grab those two objects, all right? And you're going to have one in each hand. Now you're going to do exactly what you just did with the one object, scoop and catch. However, before that object lands in your hand, actually when it's right at the top where you clapped your hands before, that's when you're going to release the second ball. Cross, cross, catch, catch. So now we're doing the same throw from the right and left, one after the other. 
cross, cross, catch, catch, cross, cross, catch, catch. It's as if you have a box. So you've got two corners up here from each of your shoulders and you're aiming across and across, making an X pattern in the air. Now I can't see you, so I don't know if you're cheating. If you're doing this, you're cheating. <laughs> All right, so what we want to do instead of, throw, oops, excuse me, instead of throwing the ball and handing one across, I want you to throw and throw so that each hand is releasing that ball into the air. Cross, cross, catch, catch. And if you find yourself being so programmed, being so stuck in this pattern where you're just handing it across, sometimes shifting which hand you start with. Starting with your less dominant hand can make a difference because we're a little less programmed. Okay, so you can switch and cross, cross, catch, catch instead of that hand across. So let's just spend a couple more minutes here and what, I'd, what I'll have you do, and we'll get to this in a moment with the learn from the drops, but if you're having trouble releasing them and catching them, take a moment and just throw, throw, drop, drop. That's it. Then look down, see where they landed, pick them up and try it again. Throw, throw, catch, catch, and start to see where you might need to make little adjustments. So what we're doing now is we're combining these two balls. We're looking at the space in between them, cross, cross, catch, catch. It's about focus and timing. Again, you're focused up, even though there's two balls now, we're still focused right here at that arc, that peak of the arc, and we're crisscrossing back and forth. All right, how are we feeling? Let me see in the chat. Is anyone trying this? And what objects are you using to juggle? I wanna, I wanna hear if, uh, who's, who's trying this and, and how it's feeling. So go ahead and, and type some comment. Using small oranges, yes, Rachel. All right, Roberta, stress balls, smarties. Oh, Monica, they're going all over the place, <laughs> okay. Yes, Chantelle's using socks, Kim's using socks, excellent. All right, beautiful. So that's something that you can continue to practice on your own. I'm gonna head back into the presentation now, but it's just such a great exercise to start to really feel that connection between the pieces. All right, here we go. So we've got break it down. Break it down, the first piece in that ball framework, B-A-L-L. -L. Second step, ask for help. We can't do it alone. We need to collaborate and connect with others. We need to build that support team and, and strengthen those relationships, get that mentor or advisor. I love to have people in, um, embrace a connection challenge where you commit to reaching out and connecting to one new person a day, one person who you've fallen out of touch with because we really need that community and that connection. I, I'm in a situation where my mom lives downstairs from us. We've, we designed this so that I could do this because I have that help. I don't know how I would do it if I didn't have that, have that help with my son. So how can you uh, make this happen, make this work in your work and your personal life? It starts with communication. You have to look at how can you more effectively communicate your vision, more clearly communicate your vision, your goals, and then start to understand how each member of your team, whether at home or your family team, learns, works, and communicates best. What do they like to do? What are their skills? Then you can start to assign specific tasks or jobs based on their unique strengths and interests and talents and passions. You know, my son likes to vacuum right now, so I'm going to take advantage of that fact and, and assign that task. So it's really knowing your team, getting to know your team, your support network, and how can you utilize that and help each other. It's not just about asking for help. Asking for help becomes a lot easier when you are also offering help and it becomes, you know, a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship where we can support each other. And it's really key to have that common purpose, to understand what are we trying to achieve and what is the process to achieve that goal? Because then we can start to innovate and come up with creative solutions for, you know, for combining the pieces, for achieving our goals and, and accomplishing what we want to accomplish. And this is only going to happen if we create an environment where everyone feels comfortable contributing their ideas, where everyone, everyone feels seen and heard. And that's going to happen when we really make it a priority to have open and honest communication with each other. So important. And I know some of the initial questions that came in um, pre-webinar asked about team building and engagement. And this is key, you know, engagement was such an issue in the, in the US workforce before the pandemic. And now even more so possibly with the fact that we're all, a lot of us are working remotely still. So how can we, you know, really keep that engagement up you know, and improve it, improve that engagement. And essentially back to the basics, engagement is about following the golden rule at every level. It's about treating others the way we'd like to be treated. And what I found, you know, in the various companies that I've worked with 
is that it really comes down to five categories, five things that we can, sort of overall categories that we can do to improve um, that employee engagement, that engagement with our work teams and with our family teams. So you have to be an authentic leader trend with transparency and accountability. We have to practice recognition and acknowledgement. Promotions and compensation may not be possible possible right now, but even simple thank yous, acknowledging the hard work that someone's done or uh, the achievement, you know, embracing learning opportunities and offering those learning opportunities to foster relationships, to have your staff feel invested and to develop those employee strengths. And then of course, as, we're as we've been talking about, you know, embracing and supporting that work-life integration, being flexible, promoting that well-being. And finally, it's that, it's that community piece, that social responsibility. And when we can connect to a larger mission or purpose, we're that much more invested. Um, one of the questions that came in was actually about, you know, how can you deal with um, uncooperative or unfriendly employees? and people that you have to work with uncooperative. And I find that one of the best ways to do that is to really start to listen and ask questions and get to their why. Why are they doing what they're doing? If you can tap into someone's purpose, the reason behind they're doing what they're doing, then you can speak to them on a different level and you can start to resolve some of those challenges. All right, so we've got break it down. We've got ask for help, learn from the drops. Some of you may have tried the throw, throw, drop, drop. We look down, we see where the balls land, we make an adjustment for the next attempt. Jugglers don't look at drops as a problem. It's part of the process. It gives us information so that we can make tweaks for the next attempt. If the ball landed all the way over there on that side of the room, I know I need to adjust this throw a little bit. So we have to take that risk and then mistakes just become stepping stones to our success and can lead us to creative solutions. You know, Maybe I kick a ball off with my foot or something like that and it may surprise us. So we have to start, we have to take that risk and then we have to really focus on being analytical and analyze what went wrong, notice, notice, notice things, make an adjustment for the next attempt. So, you know, my, my son ripped the sign off of my door. Well, I realized he wasn't really properly engaged and he wanted his mommy. So the next time I can have him engaged either being with his, his grandma, playing a game, doing a puzzle, in front of a screen, you know, they're tools, they can be utilized. <laughs> so, you know, paying attention to what works, what doesn't, and how can you tweak it for the next time so that you can have, see more success? Because then you can start to build a library of what works and what doesn't, and you can put into place a, pro a process or a practice, um, you know, and, and then it becomes automated. So it becomes that much easier. So this is just a, a, an image of the, a simple cycle, the purposeful deliberate practice cycle that's replicated you know, in, in the lean design, essentially it, it's a lot of what we've already talked about. You define the goal, you break it down into action steps, you take that first measurable action, you analyze that action's outcome, and then you make those tweaks or adjustments to improve until you, until you reach your desired outcome. That allows us to put a process or a system in place to achieve our goals. Thomas Edison said, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. So how can you start to create an environment for work and home where it's safe to drop, pick it up and try it again? We have to embrace those mistakes as information for moving forward. Finally, let it go. Whew. Some of you may have felt like that second ball or object was glued to your hand, anybody? <laughs> so it can be really hard to let go of that ball because we're afraid of dropping it, right? And we have to learn how to let go. We have to learn how to delegate those things in quadrant three that are urgent, but not important. We have to learn how to let go of things. And it can be really challenging, but how can you start to delegate or automate or eliminate things that are taking up your time and energy and not advancing uh, your own goals and priorities? Move on, done is better than perfect. Perfectionism, I see you perfectionists out there. I'm one of you, but we have to let go. Perfectionism is really about fear. We have to let go of these unrealistic expectations and let go of patterns that aren't working. Perfect doesn't really exist. And then we have to be open to having that mindset shift. So if we can change our mindset so that our obstacles become opportunities, you know, learning how to juggle is not a problem or an obstacle. It's this opportunity to learn something new and cool and fun. And if we can view our challenges that way, we're already that much further ahead to achieving our goals. And then let's try to zoom out. Let's have a mindset shift where we can zoom out and you know, look at, be present in the various seasons of our lives. You know, today 
I might be working and doing a wet doing a webinar and working and being in my office and on the computer all day and I might not see my son very much so if you look at this one day this one slice of life it's pretty unbalanced. Tomorrow I might be out on a nature walk with him and spending way more time with him and less time on the computer. So we have to zoom out and see that you know there's ups and downs and and it's not always going to be balanced or or um, you know each day or each moment. Oprah said you can have it all but not all at once. So let's review the ball framework. Yes, Angie, done is better than perfect. I, I used to have a sign on my office that says that's such a great reminder. So let's just uh, review this mantra. I really want you to adopt this mantra in your own life, break it down, ask for help, learn from the drops and let it go. I would have you all unmute and say this with me, but I've learned my lesson. I learned from the drops. Last week I was hosting um, a national speakers event and I had everyone unmute to sing happy birthday to one of our board members. Big mistake <laughs> given Zoom video delays. So just say it to yourself. I'm gonna say it one more time and I'd love for you to say it along with me. Break it down, ask for help, learn from the drops and let it go. When we break it down, you know, through the action steps, through prioritizing, we get that action plan. When we ask for help, we're collaborating, communicating, we're really building that support team that we need, especially in these crazy times. When we learn from the drops, we're starting, we're analyzing, we're putting into place a process or a system. And when we let it go, we're having that mindset shift, we're letting go of those things that are so we can hold on to so tightly and can keep us from making progress. And we're then open to more positive change. And when these four pieces are in place, that action plan, the support team, the process, and the openness to positive change. This is really the definition of continuous learning and improvement. And that is the only way that we're going to be able to stay nimble in, in this space of constant change where everything is, is constantly moving and shifting. And something that engaged my three and a half year old today may not engage him tomorrow. And it's just a constant moving and shifting and adapting and staying positive and having that mindset that you can continually, continually improve. So, uh, before we go into some, some questions, I want to give you uh, one final juggling lesson to add the third ball. So again, I'm going to uh, stop the, the PowerPoint for just a moment and <clears throat> we can spotlight that video again so that you can see uh, the three, ball, three juggling balls. And what I'd love for you to do is take two, uh, the hand that has two objects, this is the hand you're going to start with. So your hands are right around waist level. You're going to do exactly what we just did or tried to do, cross, cross, catch, catch, starting with that hand that has two, cross, cross, catch, catch, we're combining the balls. And now what we're doing is we have a process, we have a system, we're just going to continue the cycle and keep throwing one at a time. So before we catch that second ball, we're going to release the third ball up in the air, cross, 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 cross. Eventually, it looks like this, cross, 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 just like walking, right, left, right, left, right, left. I'm still focused up, right in the middle there, right at the top of that arc, cross, 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 cross. Okay, I know your juggle doesn't look like that yet. I don't expect it to. I expect you to continue to practice this, cross, cross, cross. Five minutes a day is a great brain break to just get your body up and moving and sort of refreshed and recentered. Cross, 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 cross. So I'll leave that at that for now. Um, I'd like to make this a little bit more interactive now. So I'm going to go back into um, the screen share for just a moment and hear from you. Um, oh, hang on one second. We're going to uh, get out our phones in just a moment and do a little, a little live uh, interaction here. So what I'd like you to do is get out your, get your phones handy and you're going to go to uh, a website. Uh, I see a comment here when I juggle, I throw up and not across. Yes, you might be throwing uh, too much up the middle. And that's actually an interesting, an interesting point. A lot of people feel like they're throwing forward or like their, their left hand, if that's your less dominant hand is, is not really throwing correctly, but it may mean that your first throw is not quite on the diagonal, clearing enough space for that second throw. And you might find yourself going forward instead of a little bit more diagonal. So just keep that in mind and keep focused on those upper two corners. Um, what I'd love to send you following the presentation is this PDF that you see here uh, that outlines is a fun infographic with the ball formula and the points that we've talked about, uh, reminders of the three, the three steps to learning how to juggle. 
and then some additional steps to building an effective team. So you'll have a, a chance in, in a moment to enter your email address if you'd like to receive a copy of that PDF. So head over to menti.com. And once you get to menti.com, you, um, you will see an option to enter a seven digit code. And you should see that code now at the top of your screen. 26954625. So I'll give you all a second to get there on your on your devices. You're heading to menti.com. You'll see that code and then as you enter the code, you should see this question pop up on your device. How are you feeling now? Okay, we've we've been together for about 40 minutes and you've had a chance to to try some juggling. Oh, I see relaxed is the first one coming in. Ang still anxious. Somebody's still anxious, okay? <laughs> energized, inspired, open-minded, entertained, somewhat hopeful, yay, uh, relaxing, challenged, good, yes. And now if more than one of you uh, type in the same answer, you'll see that, that word getting larger. So we've got some, some happy, entertained, energized, hopeful people. I love to see that. That's wonderful, beautiful. I'll give a, a second for a few more to come in as you're all uh, getting on to menti.com. Inspired, hopeful, happy, beautiful. So this is what we want. This is what we want to see. All right, I'm gonna to shift to the next question. Challenged and aided, beautiful. Yes, we have to really have that support. We can't do, we can't do this alone. All right, let's shift to the next question. Uh, there we go. Now we talked about, you know, looking at, at, at talking and speaking about our challenge or our problem or our obstacle as an opportunity. So what I'd love for you to do is reflect on that challenge that you may have reflected on in the beginning Okay, and look at how you can reframe how you speak about that. So for instance, I have no time to get the things done that I wanna get done, right? That I need to get done. I can change that challenge into an opportunity. I now have the opportunity to be more productive, to learn how to delegate, to empower others. So let's look at how you can tr translate that. Yes, to rebalance, I love that, to not be a perfectionist. You have this amazing opportunity to move forward, to grow, to grow others, to promote wellness, to learn a new skill, to focus on one thing at a time, revisiting your vision with the hope of achievement. Beautiful. Identify, an, an opportunity to really look and identify what's urgent and important in your life. And it's challenging. It's challenging to really break that down and identify that. To leverage your perfectionism in another way. Beautiful. To improve the way you interact with your family. Love that, to learn how to delegate and not be perfect, but rather get things done. To talk to your boss about rebalancing duties in your department, beautiful. Communication, communication, yes, yes. To prioritize your life, to ask. It can be so hard, I think, I think especially for us women, us moms, it can be so hard to reach out and ask for help, but we have to do it. To juggle, to conquer learning, even when you don't master it quickly. Yes, it takes time and each of us learn at different paces. And we have to remember that, that again, that the expert in anything was once a beginner and to have patience with ourselves. To focus on one thing at a time. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, this is wonderful. Okay, I can certainly uh, share this PDF with you as well afterwards, uh, Keith, but we're gonna move on to the next question. These are, I love seeing all these opportunities. Great. Um, so. What this may be, may be similar, but I would just love to hear again, what's one key takeaway from today? One key takeaway or message that you can put into practice right away. So something that you can take and put into action in your own life to start to feel, you know, maybe not balanced, maybe balance is not the right word, but to feel more focused, more present, more purpose in your life. What's one key takeaway? Take brain breaks. Yes, love that. Be okay with letting it go. I don't have to be perfect. Yes, perfect doesn't exist. So we all do our best, but we put these unrealistic expectations on ourselves to focus on one thing at a time. Again, to differentiate between urgent and important. Yes, done is better than perfect. Stop multitasking. Yes, multitasking doesn't work, especially if the tasks that we're trying to do require you know, cognitive focus from us. We're, we're going to be sacrificing quality. So stop the multitasking, focus. Um, some people I know had asked about apps. You can just use the timer app on your phone. I often do that and kids love timers. You know, you set the timer for this much time. This is when mommy's uh, focused on work. This is how much time we're gonna play trains. Um, you can use a Pomodoro timer. Um, there's a, an app called um, that I've used called Focus Keeper or timer that can help you to just, I'm gonna work for 25 minutes and then I take a five minute break. Or you can set the timer for what works for you. But just to have that, that outside ding and to really force yourself to focus on one thing at a time. 
uh, let's see what else is coming here. The ball framework, beautiful. Um, planning and focusing on one thing, being in the moment, highlighting the drops with your kiddos. Yes, yes, who are under five. They need to learn that mistakes are okay. Uh, done is good, focus on one thing at a time. Combine create, creativity, uh, creatively and compassionately, love that, yes. Um, when we combine you know, the things that we're passionate about, we, we ultimately feel more, more centered, definitely, and more fulfilled. All right, so final, um, final thing here is just to um, go ahead. I have the results hidden here, but I'd love for you to, if you'd like to receive that PDF that has the, um, the ball formula highlights and a fun infographic, the steps to learning how to juggle, and the, um, the extra tips for building that effective team, go ahead and enter your email address here. I'll get those uh, in and I'll get that out to you uh, right away so that you can print it out and have it up on your office wall. Uh, remind the kiddos, you know, explain to them what you're doing, teach them how to juggle, make them part of the process. Beautiful. So um, great. So some of you are putting your emails in the chat. Okay. If you can, if you're on Menti, go ahead and put your emails in there. That'll uh, make it a little bit easier for me to grab those, but I will try to grab them from the chat as well. Maybe Keith, you could, uh, okay, help me with that. Um, and before we head back into the, as you're doing this, um, we could just open it up to, to questions and then I'll head back into the, I'll give people just another minute to enter their email addresses and then we'll head back into the slides. But do we have, did you notice if we had any other questions come in, uh, Keith? Yes, so first of all, I made a complete mess. So <laughs> I threw chocolate all over candy my- Candy was everywhere. <laughs> yeah, candy was everywhere. And then I tried uh, coasters, that wasn't any good, so. Um, <laughs> But anyway, yeah, we had a we had a question here. I get the idea of prioritizing, but what do I do when everything seems so important? Okay, right. So, so we talked about that a little bit. Um, you know, if I'm juggling five balls, right? A couple things. Okay, if if you have so many balls, what do I do as a juggler, right? If I have five balls, and that's my that's the limit of my capabilities, right? I can't juggle any more than five. So, what are my options when I have all these extra things and everything seems important? Well. I can do a couple things. I can find a different pattern. So as I had showed you before, you know, maybe instead of juggling them one at a time, I'm juggling them two at a time, which makes it a little bit easier to keep it going. So that might look like, you know, as I said about batching time, you know, that might look like during your meal prep, you know, instead of making one meal at a time, I'm making three meals at a time. So I have food for the next few days. I'm batching things and I can be, I can free up my time for other things. Um, or you have to get help. If I have to juggle six important things and I just can't do it, I don't have the skill you know, to do that, it's, it's too much, I have to get help. And if I'm juggling with a partner and we have three and three now, now we can interact and have a lot more fun with a different pattern, you know, juggling together and, and working together to achieve our goals. That's great, thank you. Um, another question here, how do I figure out what the best way is to communicate with my family, the goals, so that way I am delegating? Mm -hmm. So I find, you know, it's your communication will be different, of course, depending on who you're speaking to, your spouse, your children. I find, again, you know, being just being open and clear and honest about what it is you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, very simple, you know, this is this is these are the hours I have to work. This is what I have to do. You know, how can we as a team come together? How can you help? You know, asking people, you know, how can they help? Because people want to help, right? If someone asks you, you know, how can you help? You want to help. You want to be of assistance and support each other. So just that transparency, being open and communicating and, and um, sharing a story, sharing, uh, again, tapping into the why. You know, um, if you haven't seen Simon Sinek's TED talk about uh, start with why, definitely watch that because it's, we have to tap into why we're, why we're doing what we're doing, the purpose. Um, you know, our mission. And when someone can relate to why you're doing what you're doing and they see that what's behind that, it makes that communication um, a lot easier. And then everyone can work together to achieve the goals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> another question. Can you expand more on the B steps of the ball process, B-A-L-L -L process? The B steps? Yes, sure. Break it down. So I'm going to stop, uh, stop the share for a second and uh, head back into this for just a moment. Oh. Uh, okay, this, this is just, um, just my contact information. Please feel free to connect with me. Um, whatever your favorite social media channels are, you'll find me. Um, this is a fun little tool I learned that if you have your LinkedIn app open on your phone, you can go to the search bar at the top 
and hit the QR reader and just hold it up to your screen and you will immediately be connected with me on LinkedIn. So let's stay in touch. Send me a message. Let me know that you, uh, we met here on the webinar and we'll stay in touch. Um, okay, so the B step, B in the, in the ball framework is break it down. We have to break down those tasks, um, so those overwhelming goals into individual steps. And there's kind of the three components, the break it down, the, the action steps, isolating those steps, the focus or the prioritizing, you know, we talked about really looking at what's urgent and what's important. So how can we prioritize, you know, what are our, those big rocks and how can we break those down into steps? And then how can we start to combine them? That's really the key. Once we break things down, then we have to look at how do they fit back together in new ways? How do we combine them so that we're ultimately feeling more balanced? I don't know if that helps, but uh, if you have a, a more follow-up question to that, I can certainly uh, go deeper on that. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. So let's take one more here and we'll let folks go. Um, can you give advice on delegating? So um, I've tried in the past, it hasn't worked out so well. So for, for folks who have tried to delegate or maybe they, <clears throat> they are perfectionists, like you're describing yourself, what are, what are some steps they can take to become a better delegator? It's yeah, it's really hard. It's it's really hard. And it is, a, uh, I've found, you know, in my own work, it's a process of trial and error. And, you know, I've tried to delegate tasks and, and gotten not so good results back and felt frustrated and felt why bother I could just do this myself and it would, <laughs> it would turn out better. But ultimately, in the long run, you are going to save so much time, if you can develop a process, and then be able to delegate that to someone else. So one of the key things is being clearer about what it is that you're trying to accomplish and then clearly communicating that to the person that you're delegating that to. And I mean, that's a, that's a key. People can't read our minds. So we have to, you know, take it down again, break it down to step by step. Here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Here's what I need from you, you know, to help me accomplish this. And it is going to be a trial and error. Learn from the drops. If, if you're working with someone and something didn't work, how can you, rather than just say, forget it, I can never delegate, I can never have, have someone help me. Can you speak to that person in a different way? Can you explain it better? Or can you maybe find a different person? Maybe that's not the right person to help you. What is it about that relationship that, that made it not work? Maybe there's a, the chemistry didn't work there and, or maybe they don't have the right skill set, the right talents that you need. And can you find someone else? And sometimes you might have to try a couple people um, to, to, to find the right fit. It's, you know, it's again, learning from those drops and making those tweaks until you can achieve your goal. Perfect. Well, thank you. That was not only entertaining, but a lot of great information. And I know folks got a lot out of it. I, I got a, a text during your talk saying, uh, Jen is amazing. So oh, um, thank you. Thank you. Well, I just, I'd love to just close by saying, you know, you know, at the beginning I said, we're in the most challenging time to be speaking about work-life balance, but in a way, you know, I'd like you to in invite everybody here on the call to, to reconsider that, to, to really think about embracing the perspective that maybe this is the best time. Maybe this is the best time ever when our work and lives are so intertwined, so overlapping, you know, maybe it's an opportunity for us to reevaluate our priorities and to make those creative shifts to ultimately feel more balanced, um, you know, more purposeful and more focused in our lives. So um, I would just invite everybody to continue juggling uh, and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much for having me, Keith. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And just a reminder, we will send out the video to everybody. We'll send out the slides. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad we could do these for free. All we ask is if you're enjoying these, tell your friends, tell your colleagues and family members um, to join our webinars. We'd love to add more people to this and they're fun. So Thanks a lot, Jen. Really appreciate it. And uh, I know a lot of folks are going to be reaching out to you. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.